Are you sure? <laughs> um, maybe, maybe we should introduce ourselves. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not everyone will necessarily just know who we are, so that's a good idea. Um, why don't I start then? Um, and just say, I'm Kelly Vanderbrook, and I'm the current chair of the North Park University Art Department. And today, um, I and our gallery, gallery director and artist in residence, Tim Lolly, will be talking to Rachel Lindsay Snow about um, her current uh, residency here at North Park that's taking place throughout the fall. Um, I graduated from North Park in 2013 with a BA in art and also a BA in conflict transformation. And it's nice to, and kind of surreal to be back, especially right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tim, you want to introduce yourself? You already introduced me. Yes, but you didn't, we didn't hear your voice yet, so. <laughs> I've been here for a long time. Um, it's nice to be in Wilson Hall right now because if you're alum, you might have been in this building. But it wasn't as vacant then as it is now. Uh, so, yeah, I, we're really happy to have Rachel, uh, our most recent graduate to finish an MFA. Uh, it's really exciting to have her in this residency uh, exhibition type of thing. Um, I think it's the first time that I can remember that we've had an, uh, an MFA student go on to get an MFA that has been, let's say, more expansive than her straightforward uh, studio practice. So this is very interesting. I wonder if that might even be something else we could cover at some point is just talk about the interdisciplinary nature of mm -hmm. your MFA. Um, and I mean, really your time at North Park that um, was interdisciplinary as well, not just because of the Liberal Arts Foundation, but because of your double major. Um, so I don't know, there might be something interesting there for people just about um, how your um, expansive set of interests kind of come together in an art practice too. Yeah, and I think that um, I can speak to that uh, at least initially. I think um, for me, I mean, m being an artist really kind of kicked off right before I came to North Park, um, like started making art my senior year of high school. And um, in some respects, it's like the only way that I've, I have know how to like be an artist is to also be like actively thinking about and researching things that are also part of the arts, um, but maybe don't get that label. Um, and uh, sometimes I don't always know, like the specifically the direct, they don't always come out in my art in a way that's like really obvious. Um, but in my practice, like that is something that feels really life giving and rich to my practice to be like learning all the time and learning from different disciplines. And um, I know it goes in there somehow, even if it's more abstracted in the way that it comes out. Um, so yeah, at North Park that was um, through, uh, I took quite a few courses in the um, BTS, Biblical and Theological Studies Department, um, and then ended up uh, with a conflict transformation major um, and took a lot of women and gender studies classes. Um, and then in grad school, I very quickly found in performance art or using part of like an active part of my medium and so I took uh, a lot of classes in the dance department um, because using my body was new and scary and I was like I need to be around people who are going to force me 
to do like to be thinking this way because it will not happen naturally to be incorporating that into my practice um and i continued to talk about how poetry was really important in the way that i was thinking about things and was like i've never taken a poetry class um so i was graciously invited into one um by a faculty member there and then loved it and ended up most of my written thesis was um mostly poetry so yeah I think that's, uh, that's interesting, you know, thinking about the progression of that and how from the inside of the experience, it feels maybe like sometimes um, stretching out to those new territories can be scary. Um, and it sounds a little bit like um, in the way you talk about both um, engaging with poetry for the first time and engaging with dance for the first time that that may have felt um, like, you know, like there may have been some challenge in there to do something entirely unfamiliar. Um, but also I just think about um, that those things always seem to be really a part of what you were doing, even as an undergraduate student. Um, when I think about movement, you know, I think about that work that you did, um, right after you left um, with the flower petals uh, made out of like the clay, you know, uh, just like you made so many of them. And there was something about like the process of making all of those clay pieces um, that felt maybe more important than the accumulation of them at the end. Um, but that, you know, um, there's, there's so much logic in the way that your path progressed, I think. Yeah, no, I would agree. In fact, there are things that I, I've forgotten. And then I, when I like go back, I'm like, oh, a bunch of the stuff that I wrote for my senior exhibition at Carlson at North Park, I wrote all these like little vignettes as my titles for like each piece, each title was like, three lines long and was essentially like a little poem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that that's um, the, I think something I haven't quite figured out and am still like learning about and actively learning about through this work is um, that much of my work has sort of this action component to its making that is like, very much a part of the piece. And when do I a viewer into that mm -hmm. element of the work? And when can the work, the, the residue of this action just exist as a piece? Mm -hmm. um, when does the action need to be present? When, when do I even remove the residue and just give like the, the process um, and almost, yeah. I think the answer is different for a different work. Well, I wonder if you could talk about a few specific pieces and maybe how you made the decision in that. And that might be a good place to sort of insert some images too in, um, in the video. But I think that might sound rather abstract, you know, to the listener or viewer of this conversation. You know, what does it mean to, um, to uh, focus on process and the act and then the idea of residue as being like the artwork, right? Like, or the object or the form. Um, so I think that's really, that those things might feel unfamiliar to some people who are, who are tuning in. And so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that with specific examples and how you made those choices. Sure, um, and I'll start by referencing um, uh, when I was on campus for the, the first piece I did in this series that's happening right now. Um, uh, Tim, you asked when, um, asked about like if I could sort of recall like when my more like ritual based work began and the piece that I remember making was for, for an advanced painting class um, 
my junior year at North Park. And it was that I had like 40 candles and I wrote um, names of people that were important to me um, or had been impactful in my life on these candles. And then I like stuck them on a piece of wood and just I'm like waited for them. Yeah, I just like waited for them to burn down to make these, these like wax puddles that sort of other, I don't, I don't know if I have, have a, an image of this anymore, I hope so. Um, but that was, that is sort of thinking about this for me, the, the action of sitting there and like waiting for a candle to burn all the way down and then doing another one and waiting for a candle to burn all the way down was, that was the piece for me as the maker. But then it resulted in this like abstract form, like wax form on wood, um, that I don't know one, I, I think is still embedded with all the things that were there to begin with. Um, um, but that uh, makes me think of a, a series of works that I had um, as part of an installation when I was in graduate school where I had um, in direct relation to the wax. This is sort of where wax started and I've used wax quite a bit since then. Um, one of the elements in the installation was a chair that I had covered in wax by dripping um, wax on it and I um, I only let the, the viewer into the, the, the residue portion that we talk about. So all they got was this chair that was covered in drips of wax. And, but uh, also in the space, there were videos of me doing different actions. Um, mm -hmm. I was tearing a bunch of fabric, I was crushing eggshells and but they didn't get the material residue component. They didn't get the pile of rags that resulted from the tearing of the fabric. Um, they just got the video of the action. And then there was a third, a third piece is, uh, really relates to the work that this week um, that hasn't happened yet, um, where I had a series of short poems. I called them tiny poems. Um, they were between like one and four lines and they were written on the floor in salt. And as the viewer came in, I gave them a card uh, with instructions that asked them if they chose to read the salt text on the floor that they would brush the text away upon reading. Uh, and so in some respects, those feel like three different stages of one is uh, something that has like an action really deeply embedded in it, but all you get is the final results. One is I show you an action and I don't give you any sort of anything about the video. Um, and then the third, this was an action that then something I was really interested in was asking the viewer to essentially like hold on to this information that was like just for them and for me. Um, what ended up happening was that some people didn't want to brush them away and <laughs> some people saw people not brush them away and they would chase behind them and brush them away because they hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's all funny. Like the, that sort of conundrum was funny to me or like I think also part of the work, so. Right, that's so interesting because it's like that impulse to want to like maintain the work of art like as sacred you know sacrosanct as opposed to like the work of art being in the performance that you're activating in the other people's bodies right that's that's so interesting but then other people understanding that and like overcompensating by coming back and yeah. getting rid of it that's really that's so interesting hmm. yeah did you, were you able to get, I'm, it would have been interesting, man, it would have been interesting to have some response from people about like their experience of that, like what it was like to read, read the text and then brush it away, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, I remember someone saying who chose not to, they were like, I just couldn't, like I didn't, it was like such a beautiful thing. I wanted other people to be a part of it. And then and then someone else said, yeah, I saw it and you weren't supposed to do that. Um, 
I, I think something I, I think about quite a bit right now is our like relationship to um, reality, I guess, and like how that influences or how that's also connected to our relationship to memory or our relationship to things that are happening currently and how all of these are sort of constructed and both like something that we experience a particular way and is is not actually the way that it is or is not um, the way that someone else experiences something. Um, like memory is not real. It's not actually what happened, the way that we remember things. It's this construction of, of something else, but yet it is totally real for us in the way that it continues to live in us as a memory. Um, sorry if that got kind of, mm -hmm. um, but something I was really interested in with this, this salt text and asking people to hold on to the, the memory of this thing is I, I'm interested in how we come to know something and how our mm -hmm. we think that knowledge comes in a particular way um or maybe a couple ways but i think that we continue to hold and know things in ways that are outside of some sort of like mental understanding um mm -hmm. just like like things continue in in a way that's more cyclical um and so so someone with this particular salt piece said you asked us to do this thing that's like impossible like i don't remember what i read and i thought like that's that's the point like you don't remember it the way that you think you're supposed to remember things but you part of you remembers this thing in a different way um yeah i don't know that, that makes me think about a few things. One, it brings me back to that idea of the senses. That's part of your language within your artist statement of words or things that you go back to. So how the senses, like making sense, right? And the idea of the senses. And so instinct comes from, like instinct is activated by the senses, right? And so often, like we think about instinct or the activation of the senses as this opposite pole of making sense, right? But um, making sense is just like all the language that we've built up around um, trying to put words to our sensory experience, right? And those apparatuses that happen end up being um, the ways that we explain the world to ourselves. So I don't know. I think that's I think that's really interesting too and in how if we use language differently from one another then the way that we understand the world is actually different, right? It actually leads us to experience the same thing really differently. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, and I'm I'm interested in like um uh, something I, I talked about in one of the things that I sent to you was like um, being interested in like the peripheral or like things that are in the corner of your eye and that happens for me materially like the the materials that I use are often really influenced by influenced by the places that I'm making in things mm. that I find or, or like stumble across or there have been a lot of spider in the back stairwell of my apartment building and I just keep thinking like the spider webs are gonna something is gonna happen with the spider webs I know it. Them, yeah um and I don't know what it is yet but um so that that is something that's interesting for me materially but I'm also interested in that like in some of what you were talking about how um actual senses like smelling and hearing and tasting influence our knowledge set and some of those have a certain in certain cultures have a certain hierarchy over others as being accepted ways that we know things but i'm also interested in how things like memory or fear or um like different sort of emotional components of our being that i think in in particular parts of at least white American 
uh, cultural understanding are like really not accepted, but they like are still in our being and affect like the way that we are in the world. Um, but they come out in ways that are often like ill, Ill, Ill illogical. Mm -hmm. um, or we don't have the the right set of language to know why certain things are happening. I don't know. I've been thinking about like uh, how grief, I think, functions that way for people. It mm -hmm. comes out in like the peripheral spaces of your life. Um, mm -hmm. I think we just went down a little bit of a rabbit hole. No, we didn't. Uh, it's, it's all interesting. Um, Maybe, maybe it'd be interesting to talk about um, the idea of being in relation to your work. Um, I'm not sure exactly where to go with that, but your work seems to have you really sort of centered in the idea of being, like being present, like being, actually being in a place, doing something, or at least the performances you've done thus far, I suspect the the ensuing ones will involve some of this that is, they require you to be committed to being and doing in some fashion somewhere beyond reasonable. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. you know, typically someone would take a jar of water and pour it in the other jar of water, not dip their hand in and then transform the water by the most absurd technique. That, that feels, <laughs> it's really, it's really not about, it's not about achieving. It's not about you know, like getting the thing done the fastest. It's, in some, some ways it feels like it's, it raises precisely the opposite idea culturally. That is, what is the most inefficient way you can possibly do something because it's not about getting something done. That, that the doing is not really about achieving. It's about being present to the thing. I don't know. Those are some ideas that sort of with, with your current practice sort of raise in my mind that perhaps worth commenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I um, I'm even finding myself in somewhat of a conundrum, only two pieces in with some of what you just brought up. So the 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 first piece was this um, water dripping and. I set a start time and I set an approximate amount of time. I, I for, had forgotten that North Park has this ding dong, ding dong on the hour. I was quickly like, ooh, this is good. This will give me a sense of how long it's been. Um, and the first hour went by really fast. And then the second hour, I was like, I started going like faster and more and more water was getting on the, on the sidewalk. <laughs> and, um, but with this piece, there was like sort of a clear end that I was going to be done when there was no more water in the original vessel. And when that had most of what could have been transferred from the one vessel was now in the second. Um, but the second piece that I just did this past week, the task that I gave to myself was I had a wooden bowl and I was going to sand it until it didn't exist anymore. And my wonderful partner said, well, he laughed at me when he found out this is what I was going to do. And he said, that's not going to work. And I said, I will prove you, I will prove you wrong. Um, so I bought like really, really rough sandpaper and a lot of it. And I set six hours and um, uh, about an hour in, I was a little worried, but at two hours I was like, no, I totally got this. And at hour four, I was again, very worried <laughs> um, that the bowl was still gonna be really there. And at six hours, the, there's a lot of bowl left. And now I was faced with this conundrum of like, well, it's been six hours. It's now uh, 4 p.m. I could sand for six more hours. And I think there'd still be bowl here. And it will have been 
for many hours and I'm using sandpaper by hand and yeah. Um, so I decided that I, the piece was done. It had been six hours and there was still a lot of bowl and, and, but it, it, this is something that's interesting that is also interesting to me about doing this type of time and performance action work is that I maybe do some material, like a little bit of material research um, before or test out some things, but I'm not, I'm not like practicing to sand, I'm not sanding a whole bowl by myself and then going to go sand a whole bowl in public. Um, this is like the first time that something actually happens. And so, which also makes, it's hard to know what the work is about until the work happens. And even then, um, with this particular show, I'm finding it, I'm like thinking about a lot of pieces all at once. So I would have anticipated that those first two pieces had their own titles by now, but they don't. The titles haven't come yet because um, I'm also thinking about other things. But so um, the, in the beginning you asked about being and uh, I felt it, the piece, the part of that piece that I know is that I sat on a bench and sanded a bowl for six hours. And that was, that was an important part of the work. Yep. Can I just interject a minute and say, you know, that's so interesting. I love that you take us inside your mind in that experience of making and how, you know, it, it looked different at different points to you um, in the process. Um, and I think that's so great because from the outside, a lot of your performance work looks so, um, much about kind of what Tim was saying, this idea about being present in the moment. And it's really like exhausting to be present in the yeah. moment, especially yeah. for that kind of period of time. And it like, of course you're going to sort of come out of that experience of your senses into sort of like anticipating when will this be done, you know? <laughs> or when your shoulder really hurts. Right. <laughs> Right. But I think that like, so then it seems to also include things about like mortality and limits of the body and stamina and distraction, right? Like all of those things are a part too of, of being, but also just like the process of making something repetitive. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And I, um, I, I need to cite um, this artist um, that I got to work with in January. Um, their name's Marilyn Arsim, and they are, they're a performance artist that works also in long durational. I, the, the reference of the work to it being an action or a performance action, as opposed to just being a performance piece, directly comes from, from Marilyn. Um, and I did a, I got to go to Venice in January and do a workshop, a two week workshop with her and, um, and my group of artists from like 20 countries. There were 25 of us. Um, and uh, I, I've been thinking about like the experience that I had in workshop, like in intensive, I'm with the same sort of group of people every day for two weeks, like getting up at 7 a.m., going to bed at 11 p.m. We're doing these sort of intensive things together. Um, uh, one of the pieces I did when I was there, I went up and up a ladder, swung around the top, back down the ladder again for four hours. And thinking about the experience doing those pieces as opposed to now, like the experience that I'm having doing the work now. And this is something about COVID that's really interesting in how it's affecting work in pieces um, in that uh, like being really present in the time of this time means being really present in something that's uh, 
sort of distracting and like anxiety inducing and stressful and um, like really emotionally taxing and and also doesn't provide me a lot of space to like clear clear my day and totally dedicate all of it with the bowl um and so that's interesting that's something i'm finding um i'm having to be like gracious with myself um and in the middle i flutter to thinking about the stressors in my life that that's what being also being like fully present in this time is like for me um yeah I don't want to be repetitive here. So, so my question is repetitive. Uh, you can hear you talk about that, Jen. Um, but I, I wonder, I mean, it feels like so far those two performances were, the, the, the idea was I'm going to start something and I'm going to finish it. And in both cases, it didn't happen, <laughs> right? Well, I'm just wondering about, for me, it feels like it's about the doing. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, it's about being present to the action. And I'm just curious whether having accomplishment or success, if that really is what that contributes to what you're trying to get across. Um, I'm not sure, but it, it feels like it, it's, to me, it strikes me as secondary. It feels like really principally what the piece is about is being present to, committed to an action, um, whether or not it results in, in a successful thing happening. Um, I don't know, it's just, just a thought as you're talking about it. Um, if, if that was the case, would you get stressed? Would you, would you feel like feel anxiety about, I don't, I'm not gonna have enough time, or uh, if it was just like uh, that, or just say, I'm just gonna keep doing it. You can't do this, but to say, I'm just gonna keep doing it until this thing happens. Yeah. If you could come back the next week and just keep sanding the bowl and then come back the next week. Something that you just said made me think about this. Some, in some of my nature is this desire to like, I'm, I like taking things off, like completing things. Um, but like conceptually in the work, I'm really not interested in that. Like, I don't, I don't want it to be about completing said task per se. And, uh, mm, like with, in the instance of the bowl, the bowl was like, I'm not even going to let you <laughs> complete this task. I'm going to force this to be about. And, and for me, an, uh, uh, an anxiety or a insecurity that comes in in there is then this like, um, I think sometimes as artists, we feel uh, pressure to like know what something or like full circling back to our rabbit hole, like know what something's about. So when the piece suddenly starts becoming that I didn't expect, oh, I'm not gonna be able to complete the task. There's this anxiety about, well, if the bowl is still there, what is this? Why did I just stay on the bowl for six hours? Or like, what is this piece about per se? Um, which I suppose uh, that's good. Like that, that didn't happen it forces this um, the ch challenge to even the logic that I had for something that I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's something. And I don't, I don't paint so much anymore, but the same thing used to happen for me when I painted, mm -hmm. that I always had a plan for the painting and the painting was never gonna be that thing. The painting was gonna be what the painting wanted to be and I could wrestle and be really frustrated with it, or I could just quickly realize that maybe I should just listen to what the painting wants to be. And then we have a better time together. There's this essay that 
Carl Clifton Soderstrom sent me once. Uh, I wish I remember who wrote it, but, um, but it's called Wrestling with the Irresistible. And it takes the imagery of Joseph wrestling with the angel um, as this like metaphor for the struggle of um, living an intentional and awake life um, that through this, this questioning and struggling that, um, that we may like, we may, we may be injured, you know, permanently even, but then also like what we gain is blessing. Um, and it feels a little like that to me, that idea of like the material, whatever it is, whether it's paint or whether it's, you know, the sanding of a bowl that having this idea and sort of wrestling with the reality, whatever that is, you know, in the midst of making, um, that the materials seem to have a will also, right? And, um, and a presence and they wrestle back with us. And at the end you have maybe, you know, the, the difficulty that you, or the challenge of not knowing exactly what you have, but then also like there's something, I don't know, there's something that's, it's revealed to you too, you know? There's still, it's shown you its limits or the limits of your own expectations or something. I don't know. And that feels very much like it, it sort of extends out to life, you know, and how, what happens in life. That's not really a question. That's just a comment. Sorry. Um, what were you going to say, Tim? Well, I don't know whether to say this or not because it's, it's really more about my own practice and my own thinking, but it seems like it might have some relevance. Um, I've found in the last few years that I sand, I, I'll work on painting and then I'll sand it pretty vigorously. And what happens is really strange because it, it, my intentionality is undone. And so, and it's kind of freeing because what I'm looking at, actually, I didn't make. I, in some sense, some sense, unmade it, but sanding doesn't really give the kind of control that, let's say, a brush mark is. Anyway, I, for me, that there's like something <laughs> here when that happens, that there, something different happens. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of, you know, setting up a performance, it's going to be this st structure. What happens when the structure's, you, well, one thing, can you, are you able to introduce a structure that in some way questions or, or subverts your intentionality in a way that allows the thing to become itself? <laughs> I don't know what that means exactly, but does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's, I think that's something interesting to me about about doing some of these like more longer durational action pieces is that I I could have like there there's so many elements that I could have never anticipated um, that are embedded within at least my relationship to the work um, and there's so many elements of somebody else's relationship that I, I mean, it, it in many senses really brings to the forefront the way that I think people experience art all the time. Like everyone's experience is of, of your art is different than yours. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, I don't think I had anything else to say right then. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything that we haven't talked about that uh, we should. I think we could probably wrap up anyway. Maybe the internet's telling us it's time. I think so. I think uh, that sounds good, but thank you so much for, for sharing. Yeah, it was, together. yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking questions. And it was really nice to see you both. Yes. Yeah. See you soon.